What's up guys, Bilal from OmniRip.com and in this video we're going to be learning how to make a game in 2019. Now this is unscripted, I'm just going to be creating a basic endless runner and showing you how to do it all in Unity. And people have really made this kind of complicated and had these ideas of like, oh man, it's impossible to make games or I can't do this, I can't do that. But really we're getting all that out of the way and all that we're going to do is be installing Unity and then we're going to just open it and we're going to make an endless runner and there's no no ifs, ands, or buts. Anyway, let's get into it. So I'm uh, over here with my Unity Hub open. And if you don't have Unity Hub, I'm not going to install it here on camera, but I'll show you. I mean, Unity Hub download. Google it. Find the first one. I mean, you don't even need to choose Unity. You can press download Unity Hub, and it'll give you this virtualized system where you can install. I have 2019.1.5 for the sake of this tutorial. I use these other versions for my projects because I don't like to switch a lot. Basically, I'm going to be opening Unity 2019 here, so to do that, I'm going to be pressing New here. I can pick from all these different templates. Basically, what I'm going to be doing here is just picking the 2D one, because all I'm going to be doing is, again, creating this basic endless runner here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Create, and Unity will do its thing. We'll see a bunch of fun stuff, and, and 2019 really has some cool stuff in it. Definitely recommend checking that out in the future. We're just going to see this go through and import all its scripts. Okay, so now that the Unity editor is loaded, first thing that I want to do is create a sprite here, because Unity doesn't have those uh, default sprites in. I'm basically just going to create a cube. And I wanted to do this in Illustrator because people are like, oh, I can't pay money. I can't buy this. Literally, we can do this with a free program. I can just make a square. Let's go like 300 by 300. So now that I've got a 300 by 300, I'm just going to fill it in with white. I'm just going to save this as untitled.png. Okay, so I'll move this out of the way. And I see an untitled.png on my desktop. I'm going to drag it in. We're done. Okay, so this is my square. Square. We're going to be doing a few things with this square. So one of them is I'm going to create the ground. Basically, in this game, we're going to have a ground, we're going to have a character, and we're going to have these obstacles that spawn every so often that fly towards our character. I mean, if they hit our character, uh, the game is over. I think I'll put a score text or something in there that says game over. So here's what I'll do first is I'll go into my scene and I will create a 2D object. Let's do a sprite. Make sure to have a 16 by 9 for the sake of this tutorial on. 1920 by 1080 is a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Uh, we're going to do that because uh, this is basically going to be an Android slash Windows kind of game. I'm going to drag this drag this square onto the sprite here. And I'll just kind of move this down to where the camera is. It's not too important right now It's like to make this exact. But it looks like the scale of 6 is good. Let's move it down some, kind of match it with the camera. And we should be good to go there. So this is our ground, and because it's a ground, I'm going to be adding a 2D collider to it, right? So here, like Box Collider 2D. I think I, if you have gizmos on, you should be able to see that green outline here. The next thing I'm going to do is show you really basically how to make the physics here I connect with this Box Collider. I'm also going to add a rigid body 2D here and make it kinematic. I think it can actually be static. I'm not sure if that'll work correctly or not, because it's a new feature, but we'll see. I'm going to drag in the sprite here. And I'm going to scale it down. In this transform here, I'm scaling it down to 0.25, 0.25, and 0.25. I want to pause for a second here. And for those of you who have no idea what's going on, in Unity, we have a scene, right? So there's a sample scene, and I've got game objects in it. One of them is the camera. One of them is this new sprite, is what it's called. But I'm going to rename it to the ground. Basically, what these game objects have are a set of components here. This on the right is called the inspector. And these components can be either you know scripts that we write, or they're Unity scripts, which are kind of these built-in components here. All these are components. That's just a very quick overview for those who are totally new. This is going to be the player. What I'm going to do here is just activate the physics of this player, and I'm going to run the game. I'm going to add a rigidbody 2D. This one is dynamic because it's actually going to be doing something. But I want to make sure the gravity scale is anything higher than zero. I also am going to add in a collider 2D, also a box. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to hit play, then the box is just going to fall on top of this thing. Pretty much exactly what I want. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to work on how our players' controls kind of work. So we're going to be able to move right and left, and we're going to be able to jump. So we need to make sure that we can only jump if we've landed first. And we need to make sure that when we move right and left, it's kind of this constant movement that's applied. What I'm thinking is for the sake of this tutorial we could either just directly set the velocity of the rigid body or we could add force and try to make it a little more realistic. I'm going to start with the velocity option though. Let's go ahead and uh, we see our player here and what I'm going to do is just create a new C sharp script and this is where we're actually going to program something that does something right so let's just call this one player controller. I'm going to go ahead and open this with a double click. I am using Rider by default. Uh, you will um, if you've installed Unity, you should install Visual Studio Community with it. That's pretty much what Rider is, but I just prefer Rider because it uh, has some nicer features in my opinion. Okay, and it looks like Rider is having some compiler errors. 
So I might just restart Rider here. Looks like it's compiling now. Okay, now Rider's had some fun. So let's uh, open C Sharp project. Loading, loading, love to load. Okay, so we've got our player controller here. And the thing to know about Unity from, from the start is, let's talk about a classical application has a main function, right? And the main function, you write stuff in the main function and then it executes it and then it ends. But for Unity, um, we don't really control, we, we, don't, we don't directly access this main function, right? We, we use uh, these Unity event functions and Rider actually highlights them, which is another uh, fancy feature of Rider. And so it'll say, this is a Unity event function and you know start these are kind of like life cycle functions where you know there's there's one called awake will that'll run first um there's start there's update which uh, runs every frame and they actually have these default um uh, comments here that explain what's going on there so uh just keep that in mind uh the way that we're going to communicate through unity is when stuff happens essentially in unity when unity says i want to do this we're going to say, cool, but I also want to do this. So make sure that along the way you're, you know, doing what I told you to do. And then Unity is like, for sure, dude, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. What I'm going to start with is I'm going to start with making our character like move right and left. I'm actually going to add in an awake function here. So I'll type in awake and I can auto complete it with Rider. Um, but basically just write private void awake. Um, you can even just write void awake for the sake of this tutorial because this is not like an extensive programming tutorial. So in our awake function, I'm going to grab a reference to the rigid body. So first I'm actually going to declare a rigid body 2D here. I'm going to just call, call it, you know, rigid body 2D. Don't really like that naming scheme, so we'll do it that way. Um, and then this rigid body 2D is going to equal get component rigid body 2D. So essentially what this is doing, remember what we said about components in Unity. Um, so I have this game object here, you know, each of these is a component, right? Transform, sprite, renderer. So whenever I want to reference something, I can get component by its type. And so the rigidbody2d's type is, of course, rigidbody2d. So here I'm storing a reference to the rigidbody2d. Now I can, now that Unity, or now that this, this script knows I've got a rigidbody2d attached, it, it has a reference to it. And so now I can, I can do whatever I want with the rigidbody whenever Unity does something. So like, uh, I'm going to delete the start function here because awake is, uh, I'm using awake instead. And I'm actually going to remove this update function because I'm instead going to be using fixed update, right? And what the fixed update function does is uh, it's not just, it's not the same like uh, tick rate as update. It's essentially usually a higher tick rate um, for the sake of the physics loop. So essentially, whenever you're doing stuff using Unity physics, so when you're when you're modifying the values of a rigid body 2D, or you're adding force or anything like that using a rigid body 2D function, you always want to put this kind of stuff in fixed update to make it more accurate. And that's all I'm going to say on that topic. So in fixed update, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to check for the player's input. To do that in Unity, this legacy system that's still around is you say if input dot get, and then you have two you have, you have a lot of options, but let's let's start with um, there's get key and there's get button. So get button is by string name in the input manager. For the sake of this tutorial, uh, I'm only going to be using get key, which I can directly reference um, the arrow keys here. So if I get the key, oh, and I actually lied. Uh, we don't necessarily need to move left and right. So I'm only going to be doing jumping in this and the obstacles are going to be moving um, left and right. So what I'm going to be doing here is check uh, if we get key, let's say, let's say get key down actually. And then we say key code dot spacebar. So if I hit the space key, then what I want to do is jump. We can just say, um, I don't know, uh, rigid body 2d dot add force. And we can say transform Let's say vector three or vector two dot up. Okay. And in our vector two dot up, or sorry, in our add force function, we probably want to add some additional force. So let's also have a public field here, public float, let's say jump force. And we'll just set that equal to one by default. And we can edit it in Unity if we wanted to do something different, right? So we can add force vector two dot up. Actually, I'll say times uh, jump force. And I'm pretty sure this uses force mode dot impulse. It's, we, well, we want to use impulse anyway, so I'll write it in. Okay, so I'm going to go back to Unity now. Oh, that's the wrong one. Now what we should be able to see is, um, well, we've got our player here. And we notice that we don't have a player controller attached, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag the player controller script on here. And now it's a component attached to this player game object. And so what that means is I can hit play and Unity will start, you know, uh, running those life cycle functions inside of the player controller. So if I hit space, oh, look, there's force. 
right? Okay, so why don't I go ahead and say, okay, well, that's clearly not enough. Actually, I don't even need to exit play mode for this, but I can just, you know, jump force over here in the inspector, 10, boom, right? So, I mean, like, let's say five, boom. Okay, so that's kind of the basics of, of using the inspector um, to like edit values. I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna go with a jump force of like seven because I should be able to jump over. What about six? Six should be able to jump over cubes of like the same size. Um, so that's so that's kind of what's gonna go on here. So now I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna. You notice that this actually changes back. So I'm gonna change this back to six. The reason it changes is because when you edit stuff in play mode, um, it reverts back to the actual scenes uh serialized values so you want to make sure that if you're if you're tweaking something in play mode just remember you're going to lose your changes um it's only for testing unless you're in the inspector and now the changes will stay okay so i'm going to save this scene with Control s and i'm going to hop back into rider um, and notice that i was able to jump while i was in the air so what we're going to do is use kind of this grounded check to see you know if if we've hit the ground so to do that, uh, I'm going to make a simple on collision. I'm, well, first I'm going to make a simple boolean flag, uh, and then I'm going to use on collision enter 2D uh, to say that we can jump again. So let's say private um, is grounded, and I messed that up. You need to write bool is grounded equals false. Uh, actually, I guess we can make this. Well, I'll make it false since our player is flying in the start anyway. The character is not grounded, right? So first we want to say if we hit space, we're grounded. Then we can jump. We can't jump unless the character is on the ground, you know, because that's what jumping is. Like, have you ever jumped in the from the air in real life? No, because you can't, unless there's double jumping. Anyway, so I'm gonna write um, on collision enter 2D. Just know when I'm auto completing these, just know it's important that these have the same typed um, parameters and they are called the same things, um, because that's it's important because Unity checks if the actual name of the function is on collision enter 2D. Like if I made a typo here on collision, that's not gonna work. So it needs to be on collision, enter 2D. You can't put, you can't spell it with one L, no matter how much you want to. In our other here, uh, I think all I'm gonna do is just say, is grounded, you know, equals true. Another thing I'm gonna do is say, on collision exit 2D. Uh, I'm gonna say, on, is grounded is false. Um, and I'm going to put some logs in here to make sure that this works properly because, like I said, this is not um, this is this is not scripted. I'm I'm doing this all like live. So let's say um, we're grounded, which sounds more negative than I wanted it to. We're uh, not grounded, right? So now I'm going to go back to Unity and I'm going to hit play. And oh, I can jump. I can jump. See that? See that? We're grounded. Jump. We're not grounded. Grounded. Not grounded. Grounded. So like, no matter how much you spam the space bar, this thing will not jump unless it's grounded. That's just how it is, um, and that's how it's gonna be. Okay, so um, now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and give this a save, or I think I already did save it. Yeah, I, you don't need to save anything, I'm lying. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the ground because this is really throwing me off that it's the same color as the player. So the ground is gonna be this gray thing because I hate, I hate how everything is white. Um, I'm gonna make this thing I'm gonna make this gray. And our protagonist is a good guy, so obviously he has to be green. Don't worry about how this looks. Just just focus on making this functionality work. You can always learn to make better sprites in Illustrator, um, and I'd very much recommend it, but just focus on, on the functionality here because I'm aware that this looks like an eyesore. So um, I'm gonna let our player, you know, well, a bit back down here so that we actually like kind of start on the ground. Cool, everything's working and now I'm green and stuff. Cool. And the next thing that I want to do here is I want to start creating enemies. I'm going to make an enemy that consistently moves left and then um, eventually like once it moves off screen, it'll explode or, or it'll, it'll be destroyed, right? Um, and so that way we can eventually make a spawner that will keep spawning these guys who will keep moving left and left and left. So let's go ahead and just get into that right now, right? So we need to make another C-sharp script. This is just gonna be called enemy controller. The enemy controller um, is going to let us basically, it's, it's, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna start with is just making it move left. And then I'm gonna work with making it um, hit the player essentially. So I think we're going to allow only uh, collisions with the player on these objects. And then um, whenever they collide with the player, we'll just destroy the player and print, you know, game over. So let's see. We've got a start here, so in our, I'm gonna actually change all these. So 
I'm gonna make another awake function here. And I'm gonna get another rigid body reference. I'm just gonna copy stuff over from here. So we got a rigid body reference, and then in our awake function, you know, we've got this line. So now uh, we're grabbing this component rigid body 2D from this enemy. Um, and what we're gonna do is in our fixed update function, we're going to say rigid body 2D dot add force. Um, we're just gonna say vector two dot left. And again, we're gonna have another force here. So I'm gonna copy and paste that. Uh, and we're gonna call it um, move force. I'll set it equal to like three by default, let's say. Say two actually, um, and then so now what I'm all that's happening here is just you know every frame, every I guess well every fixed update so every physics tick, um, we are gonna move left. That's it. That's all that's gonna happen here. So, well I've got an enemy controller, um, and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna test this with a um, 2D object. I'm gonna make another sprite. Actually, it's best to just copy the player here. So I'm going to duplicate the player with the control D hotkey after selecting it in the hierarchy. I'm hitting F2 here on Windows. Um, you can hit enter on Mac to rename it. Um, and I'm going to call this enemy giant enemy crab. Uh, I'm going to drag it over here and I am going to well I'll put it over on top there. Remove the player controller and I'm going to drag on the enemy controller instead. So that's a key thing to understand in Unity is that um, Again, these components, they only run on the things they're attached to. So whatever I'm referencing in this script, so if I'm referencing a rigid body, then it's gonna be referencing this rigid body from the enemy controller. Like that'll be finding the, what it's, it'll be finding the rigid body of what it's actually attached to. Um, so I'm gonna color this red now because it's evil and it wants to kill you. Um, that's a, that looks like a good red to me. Okay. Um, and all that's going to happen here is um, it might actually grind on the ground, so we might disable the uh, gravity here. But we should see it um, try to move left. And it looks like we're running into some problems here. So one thing I'm going to do is first, let's change this to force mode dot 2D dot force and see if that helps. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to disable this gravity scale. And instead of using, well, I'll let this use add force first, and then we'll see what happens. Okay, so yeah, without the gravity, then you know it moves. Oh, and now it's it's been stopped by trying to hit our player here. So um, I think that's I think this is good behavior for the sake of this video. Um, we don't really need the gravity. Uh, we don't really need an interaction with the ground anyway. So uh, I think we'll just do this, have it slide, and then once it hits the player. Boom, it should be game over. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna go ahead and create, um, I'm gonna make it so the player gets destroyed uh, when we crash into them. Let's go ahead and I think we can do a collision check. Um, you know what, actually we don't even need to do the, we don't even need to check what layer they're on um, because we're only colliding with one thing. So what we'll do here is a quick and simple um, check for what we're actually hitting. So let's say on collision enter 2D. Let's try to get the component. Um, let's say player component equals other. So in, in on collision enter 2D, the other thing is not this, right? So it's it's what we've collided. Uh, it's what we've collided with. So for example, um, since we're in this enemy controller script. Um, if we want to reference this thing in the collision, we can just say, you know, game object or this dot, you know, do something. But if we want to reference the player, then we'll say, you know, other, you know, other player. So, so let's say other dot game object dot get component. And let's just get the component player controller, right? And what I'm going to do before I continue is I'm going to create a function in the player controller that makes the player die. Excuse me, because this will make it easier for us to um, show some sort of text that says, you know, game over or whatever. So I'm going to go ahead and write a code here that doesn't work ahead of time. So we'll say player component dot uh, die, right? So then we can go to our player component, which is this player com controller. So I've used a hotkey to go to the player controller script. Um, and why don't we just go ahead and make a public function called die. And the reason that's public is course because another script is referencing it. 
So in this um, die function, uh, we're going to need to reference some UI text. Um, and we're also going to need to destroy the current object. So let's go ahead and start with a reference to um, a text field, right? So public text. And you'll notice um, it won't complete correctly, so you'll need to import unityengine.ui. Um, the way to do that is to write using unityengine.ui at the top here. OK, so we'll write public text game over text. Um, and we're just going to set that in the inspector later. But for now, we'll say, um, you know, in die game over text dot, let's just set it active for now, right? So game object dot set active true. And you'll notice that um, we didn't actually need to make this a text because I don't think I'm going to be changing the text at all. I think I'm just going to set it active. Um, so yeah, uh, for now, don't worry about that. Just write, you know, game over text dot game object dot set active. Okay, so then now the other thing I'm going to do is just destroy this object. We might run into some errors here, but I think we're fine on that. Uh, sorry, destroy game object. Oh, game object. There, like that. Um, so yeah, uh, I, we'll see if this works appropriately or not. Um, okay, so now enemy controller. Um, what I'm going to do here is actually add a check to say if... Um, if player component, you know, I, I think we can just write as player component, but I'll just check if it's null. So if the player component's not null, then, um, you know, kill the thing. Uh, the only reason this will be null is if we've collided with something that isn't the player. Um, this isn't the best practice, but in this case, um, it's kind of just a contingency plan. If we for some reason hit something that's not the player, but we should always be hitting the player. Um, okay. So why don't we go ahead and see if this works or not. So to begin with, I'm actually going to um, go ahead and click uh, a right click here in the hierarchy. I'm going to hit UI, I'm going to hit text. And what that'll do is create this canvas and it'll put a text somewhere on it. And I've scrolled out very far here because the canvas is kind of displayed in like this large um, UI view instead of the game world, which is down there. Okay, so I'm dragging the text all the way up here and I'm gonna make it bigger here. And we'll change the font size, center it. And we'll just make this uh, white as well. And we'll just say game over. And then I'm gonna deactivate it with this check mark up here in the inspector. So now that it's deactivated, um, I'm gonna go ahead and click on our player. And remember our player controller script has a reference to that game over text. So what I'm going to do here is find this text in our hierarchy and I'm just going to drag it over and put it directly in there in the inspector. And then I'm going to save the scene. And what we should see now is if I hit play, this guy is going to fly into the player. Once it hits the player, boom, player dies, says game over. Right? So that's kind of most of our game. So now the last thing that we really need to do is we just need to make it so that um, these spawns for the enemies, we just want to make it so that they, you know, the enemies actually get spawned with the game in some loop. We don't just have, you know, one enemy to dodge. So to do that, we're going to use prefabs and we're going to create uh, a basic spawning system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to where our current enemy is. And I'm going to create a, um, an empty here at the position of the uh, enemy. And a lot of people might uh, <laughs> hate this part of the video. Uh, I personally don't love using this method, but what we're going to do is we're just going to physically place the game object, um, the spawner like object where I want to spawn enemies. And then they're just going to start going left from there. Um, so I don't worry about if this, you know, is bad practice or it's not going to work. Um, we're just trying to get a game out here really quickly. Um, and I'm trying to explain how everything works. And of course, you can build your own code standards off of this. So um, I'm going to call this the enemy spawner, right? And I'm going to create a component or I'm actually first I'm going to create a script here. So let's do create a C sharp script. And we'll call this enemy spawner. Boom. And there's one more thing that I want to do. So this enemy here, what I'm going to do is just drag it into the project view. That's what this is. And what it'll do is, you see how it becomes blue and, it, and now I see an enemy here? So this is a prefab. Essentially what I'm going to be doing with this prefab, uh, prefab here 
is I'm going to reference it in the enemy spawner and then we'll just keep, you know, instantiating this prefab. Um, and now we don't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about it, you know, being a problem for like, we don't have to go and find out which enemy to spawn or, you know, spawn a new game object and apply a million different things to it. Um, we can just keep spawning this prefab. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to just delete this enemy out of the scene. Um, and don't worry, it's safe here. So at this enemy spawner, what I'm going to do is drag on the enemy spawner script. I'm going to double click on it and we have it open here. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to spawn an enemy every half second, right? So first thing I'm going to do is create a game object reference to the enemy prefab. And one thing you'll notice is that prefabs are also a game object reference. It's not a reference to a prefab. You're referencing a game object that's just not instantiated yet. So this enemy prefab is what we're going to spawn, you know, every uh, one second. I think I would like to do this with a coroutine rather than with an update loop. So what I'm going to do is actually add back the start function here. Um, and I'm also going to create a new thing that's called a coroutine. It's using this I enumerator. So uh, I'm going to write uh, private I enumerator. And we make sure that we want to use this um, system.collections.iEnumerator one. You don't want to use this generic one here because this one, it, it doesn't work correctly with the uh, coroutines. So let's say um, spawn, let's call this one spawn loop, right? So um, in this spawn loop, essentially uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to spawn an enemy, then we're going to wait half a second, and then we're going to spawn an enemy. So to do that, I'm going to create a an infinite loop. So we'll do while true. And if you put, you know, a true value in here, obviously the while loop will keep going, keep going. Um, you don't want to leave it like this because it'll, you know, crash. Um, so what I'm going to do is yield return new wait for seconds. And I'll write 0.5f. The next thing I'm going to do is above that statement. Um, and sorry, to, to give you a quick explanation, I mean, this is pretty straightforward, I think. But uh, for those of you who are a little confused, um, in this while loop, this is going to run, you know, over and over again infinitely, as I said. Um, but before it runs each iteration, it's going to have to read this code. And before we go to the next iteration, we're actually literally going to wait half of a second before the next while um, iteration is run. So that's kind of what's going on there. So what I'm going to do here is um, just write bear enemy game object equals instantiate enemy prefab and we're going to pass it the um, transform.position. So when I say transform that means referencing the cu the current game object which is this enemy spawner. Uh, we're going to be referencing that's component uh, or sorry that's transform component. Um, and so we need to also I think pass a rotation here. So what I'm going to say is uh, no rotation is what quaternion.identity means. So just type in quaternion.identity for the third parameter and that means we won't be rotating it at all. Um, and now in the start function what I'm going to do is uh, just run this i enumerator, right? So what I'm going to do here is say start coroutine, uh, spawn loop. So uh, now we can go back to Unity. We can drag in an enemy prefab. And in theory, this should work, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the enemies move a lot faster. So let's go to our enemy controller. I'm going to at least give it a five. If I hit play, we can, you know, pray it works. And hopefully we should have, you know, a game here. And so it looks like I'm having a bug here where they're all bumping in, which is kind of what I expected to happen. So um, there are two things we can do. Um, let me let me let me get a let me show you a clear view here of what's going on. So in our scene view, it's spawning, um, they're kind of spawning in each other. Um, so here's, so one solution is I actually don't want the enemies to spawn in each other. So the solution of, you know, avoiding collisions with each other is not what I'm going to bother with anyway, because enemies really, they shouldn't be hitting each other. But um, what I am going to do is I think I'm going to make the velocity um, more consistent. So what I'm going to do here is instead of the system we had where we were adding force, I'm actually just going to set the velocity equal to 
um, let's see, in the enemy controller. So go to your enemy controller here, and instead of using rigid body to add force, what I'm going to do is say rigid body 2D dot velocity equals new vector 2. Um, so what I'm going to do here is say this is going to be the negative move force because we're moving left. So that's a negative move force, which means let's go left on x axis instead of right. Um, and then I'm not even going to add any force on y. Um, so we're just not moving on y at all. So I'm going to close the console here. So if I hit play, um, now we should see that these oh, <laughs> these guys are moving a lot faster. Um, and yeah, it's it's kind of a problem. So, uh, and one thing I also noticed was that our text did not activate, so that was kind of strange. Game over text that's set up. Huh. So I should be able to, like, jump. Oh, man, but it's hard. It's so hard. Oh, oh sorry, yeah, the reason... So, okay, so one more thing that I want to say is, um, so for the text, we didn't actually align this properly, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, at the most basic form, just use uh, this, uh, what's it called, um, this anchor here. That'll make it anchor to the top and kind of the center. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is make the player, I'm going to make our gravity, I'm going to give us a lot more gravity. So let's say like three. Um, we should fall faster. And what I'm going to do is I'm also going to, oh, that's too little. Okay, so we give a gravity scale of three. And we can give a jump force of like 20. So basically what I'm trying to do here is make it so we... Oh, okay, I don't know why I did 20. So all I'm doing here is tweaking values a lot. Um, so don't put too much thought into this. Um, so I didn't like... I feel like... I guess 6 was good then. But yeah, there's no way to... Um, anyways, I'm just going to make these guys spawn slower. Let's go to our enemy spawner. Um, let's wait for one second, and let's reduce the enemy speed to like, because we're setting the velocity, it's a lot faster, so I'm going to set the move force to like two, um, and uh, you get the gist here, so I'm just editing the prefabs values, and our character is not jumping high enough at all, so let's do gravity scale of like two, and jump force of like ten. But I think 10 is going to go too high. So something something a little funky is going on here. And even this is too fast. And I need to disable the text again. So sorry, there's a, there's a couple of things that I'm like <laughs> missing while I'm uh, doing all this. But yeah, I'm going to change the... Okay, so let's make them spawn every two seconds. Or maybe three seconds so they have some distance. So obviously, um, you know, this game is like not the best experience right now. So what you want to do is tweak these values until you feel that they're good. So for me, like I feel like maybe these enemies should move a little faster for how slow my jump is, you know. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of other issues. Like, for example, um, you know, I'm these these enemies are all spawning, um, you know, at a uniform speed. It's not that it's not the most exciting experience. Let's make them move force too. Oh, not two. Sorry, I meant four. Uh, four. And there we go. Sometimes there are some not grounded bugs too. So you know, so now it's kind of a game. It kind of looks like I'm moving right, not really, but kind of. Um, and, you know, I'm jumping, and I'm going to let one of these guys hit me, and then boom, the game's over. Um, this thing keeps spawning, so we probably want to also tell that to stop spawning. But, um, you know, I don't want to go too far into making this more complex. Um, so that's kind of all I really want to cover here. I mean, you know, the next steps, I mean, if you want to run the game, you can build the game in Windows. You press Build and Run. And, you know, just pick this folder. And then, you know, the game will be running in Windows and it'll have this launcher and you can pick your resolution and so on. But um, basically, you know, all I wanted to cover in this video was um, how, how capable you... Oh, I've got some errors. 
anyway, it's not important. So basically what I wanted to cover in this video is just um, these basics of, you know, you, you're able to like put these games together um, and it doesn't really take that much effort. Um, you just have to put some understanding into it. And I didn't script any of this. I was just, I just thought I'm going to make an endless runner jumper thingy and put it together. And I realize it's not the most, it's not like the greatest code. It's not the greatest product, but the point is, um, if you're getting into game development, you have to actually finish a product. You can't just go, you can't watch a bunch of videos and then say, okay, now I know how to make a game and then try to put it together and, you know, you know, have your soul ground from how annoying it is to actually finish one of these. Um, so yeah, I would say, um, you know, I hope this one helped you, but I would say, um, get a game idea and scope it down and just get it out first. Um, and then as you, you know, get better with making these games, um, keep, keep making sure, be very, um, careful with how big you make the scope of a game. Make sure that it's a very, you know, small concept. And as you get better in game development, you can keep increasing the complexity of the games until, you know, you're really making your dream games. Um, so just keep that in mind. So like this, if you help you out, make sure to hit subscribe. If you want to see more videos like this and in the comments, let me know if this helped. Let me know if you hate me, if you hate this video, if you like this video, and uh, let me know, you know, what else you want to see with this tutorial. I can extend this. Like, if you have a question, you know, if you wanted to disable the enemy spawner on a game over, um, you know, ask that. You can ask anything about this project. You can ask anything about a different project. You can tell me to make a totally new thing, uh, and so on. Also, um, if you want a, an ebook on, like, the tools that you need to make your first game, because one thing I noticed was, you know, I opened Paint here. Uh, to make a sprite. I don't use paint to make our, my, my sprites. I use Illustrator. Um, so there's an ebook on, you know, like what the right tools are to use um, to make a game. So make sure to click on that. Also hit the bell if you want to see, um, you know, all, all the subscriptions on time. That's pretty important too. Also, if you're interested in consulting services, uh, click up there now. Um, we're going to have a survey, you know, uh, asking, you know, essentially like what kind of services you need help with and so on. Uh, if you're interested in that, if not, then, uh, I will catch you in the next video. Have an awesome day.